I'm going to run you quickly through the uh, what I think are the main findings of a, of, of a five year project it ended up being on the dynamics of ILT spread and the role of dust um, in uh, the epidemiology, diagnostics and control. A lot of people are involved in this project and I'll acknowledge them um, at the end. And we're grateful to AgriFutures for, for funding this project. Just a quick reminder about ILT. It's, it's a pretty important disease of chickens worldwide. It's caused by herpes virus, so it has all the latency and recrudescence issues associated with, um, with, uh, uh, with uh, herpes viruses. It affects both the upper respiratory tract, but conjunct conjunctivitis in the eye is also a, a target organ and, uh, and quite a lot of the clinical signs are in that area. It's common in areas or endemic in areas with very high bird and farm densities. Australia's had ongoing outbreaks, particularly in the last 15 years, um, both in broilers and, and layers, but the, in the broiler industry, we get these um, um, significant outbreaks because vaccination's not routine in the, um, in the broiler industry. Uh, we get production loss, mortality, uh, costs of pretty expensive control measures um, for this disease, a lot of biosecurity, um, vaccination to, to, to bring um, outbreaks under control. Um, and it's quite a nasty disease, um, causes quite a bit of bird suffering and reduces their welfare status. Vaccination, which is done in broilers in, in, in the face of outbreaks, uh, provides an incomplete control method. Um, uh, because of the numbers of birds in the broiler industry, you've got to use mass vaccination procedures and you tend to use uh, water-based vaccination as the standard in Australia. This can be associated with poor vaccine take, um, reactions following vaccine, vaccine reactions, the virus moving between birds and causing quite, can be quite marked clinical um, um, signs of ILT. Uh, published studies overseas have shown that you can get reversion to virulence as the attenuated live virus moves through chickens, the vaccine virus. And in Australia in particular, we've had a phenomenon of recombination of the vaccine virus with wild type virus uh, to produce new pathogenic strains that, uh, that crop up periodically and um, uh, are the cause of new outbreaks. I'm going to go through the project findings objective by objective rather than run you through each objective just so that I can keep to time. One of the first objectives was to look at the kinetics of uh, the ILT virus in vaccinated flocks once you water vaccinate. And Peter Groves, my collaborator down at the Uni of Sydney and Zoa Techni, um, uh, looked after this part of the project initially with us doing a lot of the testing. Um, the main findings were that there was, there was a lot of variation between the, the degree of vaccine take and how effect, efficient the spread was between chickens after vaccination. It was very low in some flocks. So we had sort of vaccination failure almost. Um, we showed that testing of either swab samples or dust um, at seven to eight days post vaccination gave a pretty good indication of whether vaccination had been okay or not good. Um, and, and, and those experiments were done with both the server vaccine and A20 in the field. These are field studies. Um, in those studies, we, we compared population level poultry dust um, testing with individual bird swab testing, which is not a, which is not a practical or economic way of um, monitoring this disease whereas the population test may be uh, economically viable. Uh, this work showed that uh, with the individual bird testing, that coanal cleft swabs were more convenient to collect. So that's the palatine cleft, just in the, in the upper beak, the cleft in the upper beak, easy to swab there, but had lower sensitivity of detection than the, uh, the deeper tracheal swab, more difficult to do. Um, and there's, uh, in a number of our experiments, we suspect we've had some contamination with inactive airborne virus that's just lodged um, in the, um, in the uh, uh, coanal cleft. So here's just a summary of a couple of um, a main findings. So this is the, the first study of Peter Groves uh, et al um, with eight flocks and down in the Sydney and central coast area. This is the percentage or the proportion of birds 
that are ILT positive. We did 1,645 tracheal swabs in this study, sort of 40 to 70 birds um, in each of these flocks monitored longitudinally um, over time. And you can see um, if you had effective vaccination, you'd be wanting, you know, up around that 100% vaccinated by day four. Um, the virus moves pretty quickly into that upper respiratory tract. So you can see that we had everything from just above zero to just above 50%. By seven or eight days, the, 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 the broken into two groups, a group of flocks that uh, looked to be reasonably well vaccinated, uh, that Peter called them better vaccinated, and three flocks that were pretty poorly, had, had very low initial take, still hadn't after a week afterwards, still not much virus, and then uh, different tra trajectories after that time. Now, PhD student Zaman, uh, working on the same flocks with Peter, uh, um, um, showed that a population level sampling, a bit like the, uh, you will have, you know, with, um, with COVID-19, um, the SARS virus, you can either have the individual qPCR or you'll be familiar with the uh, the sewerage tests in wastewater from different towns or suburbs and that's a population level test of what's going on in a large population rather than individuals so this here we're using dust poultry dust as a population level sample and you can see much easier to collect much easier to transport far less lab work involved or farm work to collect 121 samples and you end up with a very similar story. The three, the three farms that have fairly poor take are clearly differentiated at uh, a week, uh, seven to eight days post vaccination. The other farms are not terribly well differentiated, but you can see they all have satisfactory levels of vaccine virus. This is a viral level uh, genome copy load in the dust samples. Um, and so that looked really promising, gave us great hope that you could um, uh, use the dust test to assess vaccination practices and maybe do something about them if you're getting farms that are, that are like this. More to that story later on. So the second objective was to see if we could use some of this testing to link um, what was happening with vaccination practices and whether vaccination was a success. Um, we, uh, it was more difficult than anticipated for a number of reasons, but the early study, that first study of Groves et al showed that that skim milk uh, as a water stabiliser um, before adding your vaccine to the water was better than, um, than the dye products uh, tested in those, that was just in those uh, eight flocks. Peter then analysed 50 uh, vaccination practices in 52 flocks um, and, um, <clears throat> and that's a, a, a manuscript that's uh, been submitted and I'll show you some, some data from that in the next slide. But basically the take home message is there's a lot of variability in the way vaccination practices are applied in the field. We didn't have vaccination success or take in all those 52 flocks. It couldn't develop strong relationships um, because the dust testing ran into a problem, which we'll talk about next or soon. Um, and well, here it is, yeah. This is the problem we ran into that uh, with the dust test, a lot of the flocks that we were testing were positive at the time of vaccination. Now, in the previous slides, we were lucky and we did that work with server and A20. Um, on the places we worked and the, the flocks we worked, there was no virus circulating at the time of vaccination, you know, one to two weeks of age. However, when we went to wider field testing, we found quite a lot of samples that were positive before vaccination. And we had to sort out whether that was a contamination issue, active infection issue, and we were able to show that the birds were actively infected uh, with ILT virus, even if they didn't have clinical signs prior to vaccination. We also showed in that work that ILT could be tight. So if you had this early um, virus circulating before vaccination, if there was enough virus in your dust sample, you could type it and find out whether it was a vaccine virus or a virulent virus. Um, we also found in that field work working with Ingham's in, um, in South Australia, um, there was a major outbreak of ILT in 2019-20 uh, and um, the dust testing made a significant contribution to helping bring that outbreak under control. I don't have time to go through each of these variables. This is, this is 
Peter Grove's uh, data from analysing all of the different uh, flocks, but you can see these are minimums and maximums here, means and medians of, of all these variables um, for um, things that, that, that can influence uh, the success of vaccination. And you can see that there's quite wide ranges, you know, from, from, from three minutes to 145 minutes in terms of time that, uh, that, that, that the waters, um, uh, you've got water deprivation on, big variations in stabilisation time of your water, uh, variations in time given to consume your water, linked to that variation in the volume of water allocated uh, for each dose of vaccine uh, for, for each bird. Um, not so much variation in dose of vaccine used. So take home message there was that um, basically uh, more variation than you would like in vaccination practices, which it should be standardised. And that's, you know, because people face the real world problems of actually implementing quite a complicated process on farm. This data is from some, when we moved to the field testing, um, and this is in another subscript uh, manuscript um, with Awal Asin and another PhD student. And I'll just take, first I'll just show you what the latest, uh, what we found and we were using in this study towards the end, the, the best version of dust collection in a shed. You can just collect dust, uh, scrape it off surfaces in a shed, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's gonna be contain a lot of historical stuff if you just scrape it. So we like to collect the dust in settle plates. Um, settle plates can blow away, they're, they're various. We had some nice designs for settle plates, but we've ended up with a, a settle funnel, which we think is the best uh, way to collect this dust. And they're not hard to make up. All your apparatus should hang from wires in the shed. So these are, these just have, these are steel, uh, flat steel bent with uh, notches cut in it so that you can just thread your down wire through there. This one has a ring welded onto it so that it can fit a, a large funnel bought from Bunnings, I think, or, you know, online, the biggest funnel you can get. The bottom of the funnel is cut off and the, the lid of a collection vial is glued in there. You then sit your funnel in your support apparatus on a down wire and it can move up and down within the shed wherever it's convenient. And it's pretty, pretty steady there. It doesn't blow off as easily as some of the other things. And you screw in. Uh, a collection vial into the glued in um, top there. You then leave it for a week for the dust to collect. Um, and then you just tap the sides, unscrew your jar, grab a lid from a uh, bag of lids, put the lid on and you can send that off to the lab for PCR. So that's your population level sample. You can leave it rattling around in the, in the glove box of the ute for a week, two weeks, three weeks. It is, um, it's a stable sample. We've done other published work to show it's unaffected by temperature. If it's, uh, if it's stored dry um, and goes up to four months, whether it's frozen, fridge, room temperature or 37 degrees, no difference. So it's a very robust sample for use in diagnostics. These are some of the, um, some of the farms and just showing the, the differences in viral load in, in dust. These are each of these is a farm and then you've got two sheds in each farm and then two dust samples in each uh, shed. And you can see that this is where we started. This is what you're expecting. You're expecting uh, negative. These are the days of vaccination, uh, the day of vaccination or prior to vaccination, 7, 14, 21. And you're, we're expecting this sort of pattern, which we saw in those earlier studies, but we were finding sheds and whole farms, um, quite a lot of them, where the dust was positive at day zero. During that South Australian outbreak, uh, it was interesting to see early on when we were working sort of late December and early, early 2018, early 2019, as we, as we were testing flocks at UNE with dust, you know, a large number of them were positive at, um, uh, at the time of vaccination. So vaccine, a virus circulating at that. And then when we classed them, we were finding that we had a class seven, whereas the vaccine virus was a class one. So we had a wild type virus circulating um, in these chickens and we were able to show the birds were infected with this virus. Uh, as, as we moved on through 2019, early 2019, we started still finding flocks that were positive um, at vaccination, but the numbers that the proportions were reducing, we started finding that it was just the class one, it was the vaccine virus that we were detecting um, in, in birds at the time of vaccination. 
And then finally, um, when um, the, the outbreak was brought under control and um, confirmation of absence of virus was confirmed by 50 flocks sending in dust samples and no trace of ILTV um, found in any of those samples, uh, sort of confirming the success of the eradication program. <clears throat> We had in previously worked with shown there's a lot of ILTV in feces and you've seen previously the dust data that you can get up to, you know, a million, 10 million copies of virus, uh, viral copies, uh, genome copies per milligram of dust. We did a lot of work on this and as far as we can detect, we never have been able to isolate a live virus from excreta or from dust samples, which really surprised us, I can tell you. So we work with cell culture, we work with chick embryos, we work with susceptible chicks, trying to infect them with material from these sources um, and fail all the time. And uh, at least th there's another paper as well, but these two papers describe very well, exhaustively, how we did that work. During that work, which was led by PhD student uh, Adesu uh, Yegorov, we also studied transmission of the virus, and, 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 and that's relevant for the, the movement of vaccines through flocks as well, and for biosecurity um, measures when we're dealing with outbreaks. So actually, we were the first group to ever demonstrate that the virus is airborne transmitted. It's, it had been um, assumed in the past, um, but we showed that birds not in contact with each other, connected just by a hose or sharing a common airspace, but physically separate, you could get transmission. It wasn't particularly efficient for vaccine virus, but it was much more efficient for wild type virus. So they have a comparative advantage in airborne transmission. But transmission between birds was greatly facilitated by allowing birds to be in, in contact with each other, to run with flock mates. And that was true of vaccine viruses and wild type virus. And we suspect that, you know, part of that story is that the birds huddle um, when they're unwell, um, they get quite a lot of lacrimation and tears from the conjunctivitis. They wipe that all over their feathers. And so you have these wet wings um, and the birds are huddling. So quite a lot of opportunity for contact between birds when they have ILT. And we think that, um, you know, that's pretty important in speeding up the, the, the spread of the disease, as well as the shortened distances between birds for airborne transmission. Uh, you know, because of this focus on dust in our project, I challenged one of our PhD students, uh, Zaman, to like tell us what's in dust, like what's it composed of. So he ended up uh, with a nice paper um, in poultry science showing essentially that uh, it, it's mostly comprised less, less of feathers and bedding material um, and mostly powdered excreta. Okay, so mostly feces. And um, so knowing that we couldn't transmit um, ILT through excreta or dust, and then dust is mostly excreta, um, you know, it's pretty clear to us that ILTV um, is coming from the respiratory tract and the conjunctiva and, and, and getting down into through the ducts into the upper respiratory and digestive tracts. It's then passing through the gut. It's being inactivated by that process. Um, but the DNA fragments are still able to be detected. So we're detecting presence of, of um, viral DNA, but the virus is not um, active. So one of the early tasks we had in this project was actually to see if we could overcome that barrier. Could we, could we do something uh, about the PCR, polymerase chain reaction test, which measures DNA of an organism, could we do something about it to say, could we tweak it so that it could tell us this is an inactive virus or this is active virus? And um, uh, the, the, the idea, the basic idea behind these sort of tests is that a virus like, uh, like a, uh, a, a um, enveloped um, herpes virus has multiple layers captured and, um, and enveloped between the, the DNA of the virus and uh, the outside world. And the idea is that when a, when a virus is inactivated, that the integrity of these barriers um, is broken and that we could penetrate these with enzymes or chemicals to take out the DNA from um, inactivated virus so that it would not amplify in a PCR reaction. So a student uh, 
Yugal Bindari did quite a lot of nice work on that, essentially showed that, yes, you could remove some inactivated virus, but it was not a perfect test. Um, so essentially, um, the short answer is no. We can't tweak the test to tell us only if we've got infectious virus. Um, and that's true for other viruses and other research groups as well. No one's really cracked that one nicely. After three years of the initial project, we got, we got an extension for 18 months um, to do some additional studies. And this objective five is, is, is the, the, the work that Peter Groves undertook down at um, Uni of Sydney. Um, and that was to look at optimising practices for LT vaccination. It's shown that it was highly variable. What could we do to make it more standardised? And so Peter did, did some uh, pen studies using, using food dyes to see which bits of the respiratory tract and digestive tract and susceptible tissues were being um, stained when the birds drank, um, you know, when birds were water vaccinated under different conditions. And look, he did, did a number of those studies and they, they really showed just a little bit of basic data, the dye studies, that you need at least an hour of water deprivation um, to get good contact, good thirsty birds, getting the good contact with the susceptible tissues. Drinker heights need to be correct so the birds are reaching up, um, you know, multiple reasons for that, um, but including vaccination success. He did show in that, those um, dye studies that if the birds were deprived for water on one day and then the next day, the second day when they were deprived from water, you got a better staining and an uptake. And that led to the idea, which he followed up in a follow-up study with actual vaccination, of depriving for water for one hour the day before vaccination and then also... Um, one hour on the day of vaccination, then vaccinating, comparing that with no deprivation the day before. Unfortunately, um, although it looked promising here, when he actually did it with the vaccine, um, there was no indication that the day earlier um, deprivation to condition the birds to water deprivation helped vaccine take. In fact, if anything, it was slightly worse in that group in that study. The last part of the study was us, our group at UNE, the last part of the project during the extension was to say, well, if we've only got, if we're dealing with partial vaccination in the field or low vaccine take, you know, what does that mean in terms of the bird's protection against challenge with wild virus? Like you can't always measure that in the field because you're not just letting the virus challenge the birds and run rampant. So we could do that in a series in, in two big isolator experiments. Um, both of these, one we did with A20 vaccine and one with the server vaccine, um, which are both widely used for broilers, uh, the two mainly, the two vaccines used for broilers in Australia. Uh, both, both experiments had a factorial design, so we, we eye dropped a proportion of the birds at seven days of age, either zero, which is a negative control, uh, seven to ten percent of the birds, twenty percent of the birds to simulate poor vaccine take, or a hundred percent of the birds, which is positive control. We then came in and either seven days later or three weeks after vaccination, three, three or three and a half weeks after vaccination, to challenge them with virulent ILT virus to see how much protection they got. And the challenge was natural. We introduced two infected birds in the isolators um, and we measured heaps of things. These were really big complex experiments. And so we measured body weight and clinical signs and mortality and viral load. And I'm just going to try and show you as best I can without wading through all the results, the results in terms of a protection index. So here's an example. This is the A20 experiment, the first one we did. And you've got, um, you've got here the, the protective index, which really is the degree or the percentage to which the vaccine protected against a bad event. And here's the birds that were challenged at seven days. Here's the birds that were challenged at 25 days after vaccination. Green columns are the 7%, 20% blue, 100% um, orange uh, cells. And here we're, we're looking at protection against mortality, uh, protection against severe clinical signs, um, protection against uh, viral, when you, vac when you gave them the wild type virus, did their viral load increase through the roof um, or not? And then what, was, what, what happened to their average daily gain over the period um, seven, 
uh, seven days the week following challenge. And it had no effect actually um, um, in birds challenged at 14 days of age. Interestingly, the virus just had no effect on, on, on growth. It did later on. Okay, so all we can see in broad terms from that first experiment is that even 100% vaccination didn't provide total protection against mortality clinical signs, gave really good protection against increase in viral load, just, just blew that out of the water. Um, and uh, as I say, there was no effect of challenge on, on growth. What we can see is that when the birds were challenged at 25 days post vaccination, you can see that the partial vaccination, particularly 7%, didn't do too much uh, at, at, at seven. At, at 25, the blue and the green are providing variable levels of protection against these adverse effects. When we did the experiment with, with, with server, um, uh, and, and in a way, a, a better experiment with lower bird numbers in the isolators and a few less density related problems. Um, we got very nice protection uh, with 100% vaccination. Um, and, and again, a little, little improvement with, that, with the level of coverage uh, with imperfect vaccination um, at 21 DPV. Again, we saw this same thing. Even unvaccinated birds, they had clinical signs, even some mortality when challenged at day seven, but no growth impairment, which was, which was quite interesting. Uh, however, at day 20, at late challenge, it, it did severely affect their growth. Anyway, so um, variable levels of protection. I better uh, screed through these main conclusions. Um, so ILT vaccination practices and the outcomes in the field vary substantially. So you need to follow um, guidelines, vaccination guidelines really closely. The vaccination teams have to follow their SOPs to achieve adequate initial vaccine take. Although, par although partial vaccine take or incomplete vaccine take will give you some protection later on, you should not rely on it or, or, or hope that it can cover up poor vaccination technique because it won't get rid of the problems of uh, rolling um, vaccine spread between birds with vaccine reactions, increased risk of reversion to virulence, increased risk of early challenge and lack of protection, increased risk of recombination. Um, we showed clearly in this experiment or oh, in this project, the dust samples, a population level sample collected at the time of vaccination and seven days later. So you got to do two collections. You've got to put your dust collectors in at placement, collect dust, you know, seven or 10 days whenever you're vaccinating. And then a week later, that'll tell you whether your vaccination practices are working okay or not. If there's no virus circulating initially, if there is virus circulating before vaccination, it will let you know that and you can potentially type the virus and find out what's going on in those birds that are infected with ILT so young. Both UNE or Burling Avian Labs can do that, uh, those, those dust tests um, uh, for, at a commercial service. Um, excreta and dust appear to play little role in ILTV transmission and contain mostly inactivated ILT DNA. It doesn't mean they're not valuable for diagnostic purposes, um, or for measuring what's happening, but they don't tell you this is the amount of infective virus um, in the herd. Direct in the flock. Direct contact between chickens really facilitates transmission, so it's not just all airborne spread. Um, with those take-home messages, I'd like to just acknowledge, you know, thanks to AgriFutures uh, for funding. The students all had scholarships. We had five PhD students ended up working on some aspect or other of this project together with other things. Peter Groves and Priscilla Gerber were great uh, collaborators, co-investigators to work with. And we had wonderful support and collaboration from all these great people in industry and also helpers in our, uh, in our labs and isolated facilities at UNE. So thanks everyone for listening to that. Steve, we have time for a couple of quick questions. Mm -hmm. Is ILTV more prevalent in free range chickens or is there no difference among broiler flocks? Um, you mean I'm not aware, I'm, I'm not close enough to the day-to-day the -day field situation um, to know, but my, 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 I, I've not heard that it's a particular problem in free-range flocks. It doesn't have a very wide host range, the ILT virus, so 
it's a chicken disease, um, probably transmitted and introduced partially airborne, but not by wild birds, for example. Um, so there's no a priori reason why um, free range flocks would get it more than intensive flocks. The next question, what was the criteria to be an infected bird to introduce into the partially vaccinated birds to mimic a natural infection? So what we did was we, uh, we had separate isolators with these birds in them. We challenged them. So four days before we wanted to introduce the birds to do the challenge, because we know, we know viral shedding peaks around day four. So four days before introduction, we infected them by eye drop with a wild... Uh, with the class nine wild virus. Um, we then confirmed, so that we either the night before or the morning of the day they were going to be transferred, they were swabbed and we did PCR. We had a few extra chickens and only those that were PCR positive for the virus um, was introduced. By then we usually had, you know, most of the birds had early clinical signs starting. And so, so they went in. Uh, so that's that's how we mimicked it, and it was it was it was really very effective. I mean, there, when when you look at the PCR data, um, you know, and, and transmission, um, the virus, the, the 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 challenge model, we think is a very good one. I, I didn't have time to show you um, all of that data. Last quick question: Do you have an opinion on effectiveness of fifty percent vaccination given two days in a row? I don't. It was one of the options for Peter Groves to test uh, together with the depriving water the day before. Um, <clears throat> it's quite a lot of extra work um, to do that. The vaccination process is, um, is, is quite a complicated one to do well twice. Um, it could possibly give you some additional coverage by a bird that, um, that didn't get taken on the first time get taken on the second but you know it, it it's it's pure speculation and I, and I, and um we weren't able and i don't think uh we're resourced to to test that um um actual proposition um and so yeah i can't 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 give a de definitive answer but i think i think a properly executed um uh vaccination um would be the go and then Possibly, if you thought something went wrong with that vaccination, you know, do a supplementary one later rather than, than, than trying to do it twice. It's hard enough to get it right once. Um, getting it right twice in two successive days may be even more difficult. Those are just my thoughts. Thank you so much, Steve. That's been fantastic.